Okay, ventilation and perfusion. So when I talked uh, in my first uh, video on the pulmonary system, I was talking about how um, one of the major functional um, roles of the lung is to match the ventilation of air with the perfusion of blood through the lungs because really that's what our goal is is to bring together the you know four liters of air that we're breathing in every minute with the you know five liters of blood that is flowing through the lungs from the heart and to put these two things together uh, across a very wide surface area with you know just a very thin uh, two microgram membrane in between them so that the air can um, the oxygen can dissolve into the bloodstream and the carbon dioxide can dissolve out of the bloodstream and uh, be carried into in and out of, the, out of the lungs in the air. So I wanted to talk a little bit about ventilation and perfusion and first of all a little bit about vocabulary here. Um, there is a scan that we use called the VQ scan or the ventilation perfusion scan that, it, um, that is used to measure um, how well our lungs are doing at matching ventilation and perfusion. Now the scan is called two things, ventilation perfusion scan or a ventilation quotient scan. And really ventilation and perfusion, um, the ventilation and perfusion quotient is just the percentage of of air that it perfuses into our bloodstream at any given time. And a normal value is about 0 0.9. So about 90% of the air that we breathe in is efficiently um, carried into our bloodstream. So that is the ventilation perfusion quotient. And a lot of times people started, instead of calling it a ventilation perfusion scan um, or a ventilation perfusion quotient scan, they just started calling it a ventilation quotient scan. And then the first two letters of this, V and Q, became associated with ventilation and perfusion. So that is why Q now sort of has become, um, it has become standard for the Q to stand for perfusion. In reality it stands for quotient, but um, because it's been used over the years it now stands for perfusion. So that's just a brief explanation of why Q stands for perfusion so it doesn't confuse you because every year it confuses my students. And it's not very rational but it's just tradition. So ventilation and perfusion. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the three zones of the lungs and you know in, in a way this is important to understand but it does not necessarily reflect reality and you're going to see it in lots and lots of pathophysiology textbooks and you know I guess it's useful in sort of understanding the concept of the lungs but um, it doesn't always reflect reality. Okay, so basically with this three zone system, we are divided up between zone one and the apex, and zone two in the middle, and zone three at the base. Now, because of the effects of gravity, um, zone two, uh, I mean zone three, I'm going to start out with zone three, is, um, is going to have veins that tend to be very distended. And when they pass through the alveoli, actually, I'm going to have the pulmonary arteries come in on this side and they're deoxygenated, and then the pulmonary veins will leave oxygenated on the other side, right? And then in the middle we have alveoli. Now in zone 3 the veins are going to be very distended because of gravity. Remember this is a low pressure system so if you add a few extra um, millimeters of water um, below the heart you're going to increase the pressure of the veins and distend the veins significantly. And that is going to, all, and it's also going to cause the alveoli to be very sort of small and shriveled. Now, on zone one, on the other hand, this is going to be above the heart, so we're going to have lower blood pressures. Um, 
coming in through the pulmonary artery. And so the arteries and the veins are going to be very small and not at all distended. And the alveoli are going to be very sort of over distended. Now here in zone two, the alveoli are going to be just right and the pulmonary artery is going to be just right. And because of this, you know, we have poor perfusion and lots of blood flow here. So the um, the perfusion in, bay in zone three is going to be much greater than the ventilation, right? Actually, I should just write it this way. Ventilation here is going to be less than perfusion. In zone two, ventilation is going to be equal to perfusion. And in zone three, ventilation is going to be much greater than perfusion. And that's because the alveoli are distended and the veins are, are, um, are not. This is very little blood flow in zone one, but a lot of ventilation. And in zone three, um, the ventilation is going to be less than perfusion because the veins are very distended because of high pressures and the alveoli are collapsed. So this is useful in that it gives you an idea of, of how um, gravity plays a role in, um, in affecting blood flow and ventilation in our lungs. However, our lungs are f physiologically very active. And there's a couple of things that I want to talk about here to point, point out how they are physiologically active. So these three zones do not just happen um, because the lungs sort of have things to counteract them. Now remember that usually when we are breathing, we are breathing tidal breaths, right? And we're only using about 500 mLs of our lungs at any given time and our lungs are partially unfilled. You know, there are, we're only filling them up to about half of capacity, 27 out of the total of six liters of capacity. So most of our, um, over half of our alveoli are collapsed at any given time. Now, you know, you would wonder if we are perfusing all of those collapsed alveoli, then we would have a lot of blood a lot of our blood flowing past collapsed alveoli. All right. So zone three would be um, actually larger than is actually larger than half the lung. But what's interesting is that the bo the body has a process um, called hypoxic vasoconstriction. That any time there are alveoli that are not being ventilated. And, you do not, and have low levels of oxygen, this causes the muscles in the pulmonary arteries to constrict. And as the muscles constrict, um, this dramatically decreases the blood flow to the unoxygenated alveoli in the lungs. So what we have here is a balancing of these effects in zone number two. And because we're having very little blood flow to this area, I should make that in blue and red, but you get the point. These become very, very narrow. Um, this increases the blood pressure slightly and the blood flow to the other areas of the lung, particularly to zone. And actually what this does is it, it just it has an effect of just increasing the size of zone two so that zone one is very small and zone three is getting very little blood flow. So, okay, so again, that is called the process of hypoxic vasoconstriction. So with hypoxic vasoconstriction, what the lungs would look like 
is we'd have a very small zone 1 at the top and we'd have a you know fairly large zone 2 in the middle and then a zone 3 at the base that is neither that is neither perfused it's not perfused and it's not ventilated so the alveoli are collapsed and so are the pulmonary arteries essentially just minimal blood flow and minimal ventilation now when we use our inspiratory uh, reserve volume and take a deep breath then we are going to open up these alveoli and we will restore some blood flow to them and again if we're exercising we're going to expand the use of our our lungs significantly and we're going to use um, you know 90 95 percent of our lungs um, whereas during tidal volumes we're, we're only using a very small amount of our lungs okay so I wanted to talk a little bit about hypoxia and a concept called shunt. Now what's interesting is the again the body has a very good way of matching ventilation to perfusion and this is primarily done through the, the process of hypoxic vasoconstriction and again this is this occurs because our pulmonary arterioles have smooth muscles on them that in a setting of hypoxia they're stimulated by low oxygen level to constrict and when they constrict they significantly decrease the lumen of the pulmonary arterioles flowing to the hypoxic um, alveoli in that area, right? So this hypoxic vasoconstriction makes sure that only well-ventilated alveoli receive blood flow. And all the collapsed alveoli that aren't being um, ventilated at that time are not going to be perfused. So it's a hypoxic vasoconstriction that assures a healthy ventilation per perfusion quotient of around 0 0.9 or so. So what causes it to fall? Well, let's take an, uh, an example of a patient with pneumonia. So we've got two healthy lungs here and the patient is breathing away. But what happens is this patient has very bad pneumonia and all of a sudden you know the patient with this nasty infection um, is no can no longer ventilate this part of the lung. So about 25 percent of the lung is not ventilated. Now, just the fact that we haven't ventilated the now, if we have hypoxic vasoconstriction, this part of the lung also won't be perfused, right? So, if hypoxic vasoconstriction was intact, then it would neither be ventilated nor perfused, and the VQ ventilation perfusion quotient would remain unchanged at around 0 0.9. But what happens with pneumonia is we have inflammatory mediators because of the infection. And what does inflammation do? The release of prostaglandins and histamine, it causes vasodilation. So the vasodilation counteracts the process of vasoconstriction and therefore we get perfusion to this area of the lung. Now okay so let's say we've got 75 percent of our lung here that is ventilated and perfused 
very well and it is um, that portion of the blood that is flowing through that uh, that healthy lung is being perfused um, and oxygenated with a partial pressure of oxygen around 95 millimeters of mercury and that equals a saturation of you know 95 percent so 95 percent of the hemoglobin molecules are saturated with oxygen but this part here this 25 percent of the lungs has a PO2 of zero because it's socked in all the alveoli are pus filled right so that is a saturation of zero now if you do some calculations here and you have 75 percent of your blood that has a PO2 of 95 millimeters of mercury and another 25 percent with zero millimeters of mercury you're going to end up with an average if once all this blood gets mixed together you're going to have an average PO2 of around 72 millimeters of mercury and this is going to be equivalent to an oxygen saturation in the 80s maybe 85 percent of course that depends on what's going on with the uh, um, oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and other factors but as you can see if you are perfusing unventilated alveoli you are going to significantly drop your oxygen saturations and now when this occurs this is called a shunt because we have blood that is flowing through unoxygenated lung and it means a shunt because it's it's akin to the blood just bypassing the lung altogether because it's essentially bypassing all um, ventilated alveoli and returning right to the heart unoxygenated right so that is called a shunt or sort of a bypass bypassing the alveoli and relatively small shunts can have a huge impact on the oxygenation. Now, if the vasodilation is completely overwhelming the vasoconstriction, you may actually increase the blood flow to this area at with decreased blood flow to the healthy lung, and that can drop the oxygen saturations even further. So that's why with an with pneumonia you can end up with very very low sats even though the pneumonia is only taking up a small portion of the lung. Okay so that was my brief introduction to uh, ventilation and perfusion and uh, please let me know if you have any questions.